Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to be doing my Forum 2 uh, for the American Revolution class at Liberty University on Mercy Otis Warren. Um, and I wanted to begin by uh, stating that historians must be objective and honest in their investigations and must be dedicated to a reasoned and investigated reconstruction of primary sources. Uh, Mercy wrote pamphlets and plays attacking the British and uh, the British governor specifically of Massachusetts Thomas Hutchinson. This, for a woman to do this, this was really unprecedented for the time. Uh, she also wrote uh, to the Continental Congress and described the atrocities that were going on in Massachusetts and, and she was encouraged by them uh, and these other revolutionaries to continue this practice as it was an excellent way to reach the masses and it was really a great way to inform those at the Continental Congress so then uh, different states or different um, different states would be able to understand what's going on up there and be able to make the sound decisions necessary that they were um, supposed to be making at that time in Philadelphia. Mercy Otis Warren was born in Barnstable, Massachusetts on September 14, 1728 to James and Mary Otis. She was the first girl among the 13 children they would have. James saw the potential of young Mercy and he encouraged her to study with her uncle during his bro her brother's James Jr.'s tutoring sessions. She was classically educated and learned both Greek and Latin, and was educated throughout uh, through tutoring with her other brothers. Jemmy, as Mercy called her oldest brother, would share what he learned with Mercy, and she would develop a liking for Shakespeare and Dryden, and also the writings of Locke. Mercy met her husband, James Warren, who was a Son of Liberty member in Massachusetts, as he was a friend of her brother in college, and they were married on November 14, 1754. Uh, Warren's first work, uh, called An Adulator, was uh, published in March of 1772, and it was the first political satire that presented uh, caricatures of Thomas Hutchinson, Andrew and Peter Oliver, and portrayed them in a, as a self-serving, uh, they were prepared to spill blood whenever necessary to line their pockets and to win the greater favor of King George III. Their efforts were to enslave a small group of patriots who were led by the character Brutus. Mercy's second political satire, The Defeat, published in the Boston Gazette in May and July of 1773, comprised of the same characters who were seen in her earlier work. However, they were, there was more of an emphasis on the patriot cause for rising up, and the portrayal of Hutchinson was hanging, much like his Hutchinson's effigy previously in Boston. In Mercy's third satire, called The Group, that was published in the Boston Gazette and the Massachusetts Spy in January of 1775. It portrayed a small group of Tory loyalists who were vain, self-serving, and really brimming with misogyny. Um, and they would eventually uh, choose to leave in exile um, due to the political climate of the time. Um, and Mercy, uh, she was very apprehensive to, um, to make these publishings and publish these satires. Uh, at the time, she really doubted her ability to convey the themes of her writing and uh, presented her intent uh, clearly and effectively. She really doubted her abilities, and uh, one person that really helped that was John Adams. Adams would write to her with great praise for her efforts prior to the outbreak of the Revolution when he said, Indeed, I know of none ancient or modern which has reached the tender, the pathetic, the keen, and the severe, and at the same time the soft, the sweet, the amiable, and the pure in great perfection. As women were not commonly published at the time, um, Mercy used a pseudonym at times to try and uh, present herself as somebody else. Um, in Mercy's third vol or three part volume, History of the Rise, Progress, and Termination of the American Revolution, with biography, political, and moral observations, Mercy's moral observations portion highlighted a difficult conflict between her and John Adams, where she portrayed Adams as a great contributor to releasing the colonies from depotism. However, her political differences shined in her summary of John's views of government. She describes Adams in his role as ambassador to Britain, a John Adams who was dwindling into a hopeless Anglophile and forgotten to repudiate his earlier devotion to Republican principles. It may, however, she concludes, be charitably presumed that by living long near the splendor of courts and the courtiers, 
he might become so biased in his judgment as to think that an hereditary monarchy was the best government for his native country. In her final volume, the concluding pages talked of the improvement that America was transitioning into. However, she also showed her concern for the next generation, embracing of Republican principles. This is significant, as this assessment comes from one whose life and career as a writer were dedicated to those very principles. Otis Warren would die in Plymouth on October 19, 1814, as one of the most influential women of the Revolution, and is considered a great historian of her time, paralleling the Whig historian views of the 18th century. Thank you.